Good day everyone. Welcome to all of our viewers watching online here in the Philippines and worldwide. This is the Public Sector Productivity Webisodes, a series of webinars that aim to raise awareness on relevant productivity and innovation topics and help mobilize public sector organizations. I'm Gerard Calambro and I will be your moderator for today. To start, let us give a warm shout out to all of our attendees today. I can see we are joined by agencies from the National Historical Commission, the Social Security System, the Office of the Ombudsman, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, the National Economic and Development Authority, the Philippine Children's Medical Center, the Department of Labor and Employment, the Department of Education, the Department of Social Welfare and Development, and the Occidental Mindoro State College. And to the ones I haven't mentioned, I would also like to thank you for joining us today and welcome to this webisode. Here at the Development Academy of the Philippines, we play a crucial role in nation building by generating pioneering ideas, promoting partnerships, and capacitating stakeholders. And this is why we are hosting these webinars. We want to give you new ideas. We want to connect you to people. And we want to help you do better. With that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today's expert. Our speaker is a career executive service eligible with 27 years of experience in the public sector. He is also a senior executive fellow of the DAP Council of Fellows concurrently the Vice President of the Corporate Concern Center, former Dean of the DEP Graduate School of Public and Development Management, and a former Managing Director of the DEP Center for Sustainable Human Development. He earned his AB Philosophy from the Holy Name University as cum laude, MA in Philosophy from the University of Santo Tomas as magna cum laude, and PhD in Applied Anthropology from Asian Social Institute with the highest distinction. He receives fellowships from the Asian Productivity Organization, the Asian Development Bank, the Colombo Plan, the German Agency for International Cooperation, or GIZ, the World Bank, the United Nations Environment Program, and the Ecole Nationale de Administration based in Paris, France. Today's speaker is also an associate member of the National Research Council of the Philippines and the Association of Government Internal Auditors. He is DAP's internal resource person on project, risk, and strategic management and serves as a faculty advisor and thesis panel member of the Academy's Master in Public Management Program, MPM, and the Public Management Development Program, or the PMDP. He chairs the DAP Change Management Committee and supervised organization studies for the Development Bank of the Philippines, the Department of Health, the National Transmission Commission, the Power Sector Assets and Liabilities Management Corporation, the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation, and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. Additionally, he was trained in strategic foresight and scenario planning by the Asian Productivity Organization in 2019. Since then, he has assisted various agencies and state universities in their respective scenario planning exercises. Let me welcome our speaker, Dr. Alan Cajes. Good afternoon, Dr. Cajes. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Welcome to our session on strategic foresight, futures thinking, and scenario planning. Now, this topic is composed of two parts. Uh, the first part, which is today, we will talk about the concepts and principles of future thinking for the public sector. And tomorrow at the same time, I will walk you through the steps in scenario planning. Now, let's begin by trying to imagine these kids, perhaps your children or your younger sibling, and they are thinking about their future, say 10 to 15 years from today. We normally prepare a plan A, but we also have a plan B or a plan C in case plan A won't happen as we expected or as we planned. So the children also think along this line and consider the following futures. One, 
as a professional or skilled worker, say a physician or a nurse. And then maybe they can work abroad or in the public or private hospitals, depending on the situation in the future. Two, they can become politicians. Maybe someone in the family is into politics. Three, they can become entrepreneurs. Maybe they think that this is a good way of earning a good living. Or four, as a religious, maybe because of influences in the school or in their church. Now, young as they are, they are somehow aware of their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strengths like their honor student, they play the piano. Weakness like, well, they are shy, coming from a low middle class. And they are also aware of certain opportunities like possible scholarships or partial scholarship grants when they go to higher education institutions. But they're also aware of what we call as threats or disruptive events, including disasters, economic shocks. And uh, we know that this can change the economic condition of a household. So moving forward to their future, they invest in key actions or you might consider them as strategies, including maintaining good grades, keeping good company, participating in school activities, avoiding bad habits, being nice, choosing affordable school, which means avoiding stress in paying tuition fees or school fees. And another strategy as an example is to excel in at least one competency. In this particular example, writing skills. Now we call this robust strategies because these kids and their parents believe that these strategies will help the children when they grow up in navigating their future in case any of the scenarios happen. They are not certain which of the four futures might happen in the future, but at least if they keep or stick to these robust strategies, they are likely to succeed. Now let us transition to a public sector organization, a government agency, government corporation, a state university or college, or a local government unit. And imagine a local government unit with the following indicative strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This LGU has a stable allocation from the General Appropriations Act. An example of a weakness is insufficient human capital. An example of opportunity is the availability of grants from other government agencies or from the national government. And an example or examples of threats would be disruptive events, including the pandemic that we are experiencing now, the related economic shocks, and of course, the challenge of climate change. Now, this LGU is experiencing a new normal something it did not experience in the past. In particular, some of the threats are unpredictable. So planning for a single future is probably not the best option for this LGU. So this LGU starts thinking about four future scenarios or multiple futures. The business as usual may be same as the current situation, an ideal future, and a preferred future, and of course, a situation that is better than the current one. So they have four possible scenarios 10, 15 years from today. Now, given the uncertainty as to what kind of future will unfold of these four possible futures, this LGO will have to deal with this question, or your respective organizations will have to answer this question. What do you think are the robust or best possible strategies to deal with your uncertain futures. When we start asking this question, ladies and gentlemen, we are entering the field of futures thinking. Now, what is futures thinking? Let's start with some concepts. Futures thinking is the use of divergent and creative thinking so that we can create multiple scenarios or stories about what might happen in the future in relation to our respective organizations and given the critical uncertainties or drivers of change that we are facing today. So futures thinking refers to the theory and methods in general. Now, future studies is an application of futures thinking and it focuses on multiple futures, not one future, but more than one futures. The time horizon is 15 years. An example of a tool used in futures thinking is the Delphi method. And this approach relies on the qualitative data that are provided by experts or based on experts' knowledge. 
Now, foresight is another technique related to future studies. And strategic foresight uses scenarios with a horizon of 5 to 15 years. Other organizations use a horizon of more than 15 years. Now, thinking about the future, however, is not an easy task. And here are some reasons why thinking about the future is difficult. We are living in what we call a VOCA world, characterized by volatility, which refers to unexpected or unstable situation with a known duration. But it is not hard to understand. We can actually understand it. And an example of this is the fluctuation of prices of commodities during or after a disaster. And right now, we are experiencing an oil price high. And that is an example of a volatile situation. Now, uncertainty is a situation in which the causes and effects are known and change is possible but not a given. Example is a competitor's launch of a new product and what might be the effect of this on the market. The third one is complexity. Complexity is a situation in which some information is available or can be predicted. However, the nature and the volume of this information can be overwhelming and very difficult to process. For instance, in 2020, data shows that we produced an estimated 2.5 quintillion databytes per day. That is last year. That is a lot of information to process by the human brain. That is why data science and data analytics are trending as a field of study since the data is considered as the new oil. Now, another characteristic of the VOCA world is ambiguity. Ambiguity is a situation in which there are different perspectives and viewpoints. There is a confusion about the cause and effect. There are no precedents, or we are dealing with what we call as unknown unknowns. An example is, of this is what happens under the new normal. The COVID-19 era, in particular, coupled with global warming, among others. We only experience this type or level of pandemic now. It has no exact precedent in the past. Now, on top of the VOCA world, we are also dealing with other drivers of change, such as wild cards and black swans. Now, wild cards, also known as outliers, they are scenarios that we can imagine, but they are low probability events and developments that will affect our future significantly. According to Rockefeller in 1994, Wild cards are events that have low probability of occurrence, but they are inordinately or they have excessive or high impact. What are examples of wild cards? Rockefeller mentioned nuclear weapons, artificial satellites, World War I, and the Second World War. And of course, the pandemic that we are experiencing now falls under the category of wild cards. Now, some think that the pandemic is a black swan, but I read somewhere, even the author of the book that uh, first introduced the concept of black swan said that this pandemic is actually not a black swan. So what is a black swan? So this is another driving force, and it is an event that is not in the radar. It has no precedent. It is improbable. It is unlikely. So this event, can only be identified after it has occurred or after it has happened. Some examples of black swans are the internet, computers, of course, starting with the personal computer or the PC, the 9-11 attacks, among others. Now, still on top of the VOCA, wild cards and the black swan driving forces, we also have our own biases and blind spots. We have different fields of study, fields of expertise, specialization, or experience in particular. We cannot possibly know everything. And our tools are also limited. We have finite resources and capacities, therefore, to know exactly 
what will happen in the future. This was a problem experienced by Shell International in the 1960s when their unified planning machinery, a computer-driven system established or set up in 1965. And this unified planning machinery gave them forecast of up to six years. But the system was unable at one time to provide forecast about the oil crisis in the 70s. And this event significantly affected the business performance of Shell International. Now, forecasts, according to Pierre Wack, are not always wrong. However, when they fail to anticipate major shifts in the business environment, organizations like Shell would have or will be facing obsolete business strategies. If you recall, the supply of oil was disrupted in 1972 due to a conflict in the Middle East, which led to the low supply of oil and the corresponding increase in, in prices. Now, how are we responding or how do we cope with these events of uncertainty? Now, our typical responses could include the following. One, we can deny or we can use denial as a coping mechanism. We can deny that a not so good or a bad scenario may not happen. Or we can oversimplify by saying or by sticking to a linear thinking process. We can also somehow express false confidence that we can survive whatever happens in the future. Or we can experience paralysis. We don't know what to do. We cannot make a decision. Or we can plan for everything, which is not obviously an optimal use of resources. Now, another approach is we can just wait and see and then strategize later. Unfortunately, good leaders and managers cannot rely on these typical responses. There has to be a better way. A better way, therefore, must be around the corner. So a possible better way is futures thinking, which is described as the immune system of a civilization. When our civilization landed on the moon, or at least few individuals on the moon, NASA scientists had to make sure that the aircrafts or the spaceships will complete their mission despite the possible uncertainties in space, the turbulences among others. This was done using wind tunnels. Here, the wind tunnels is used so that the engineers would learn how to best navigate an aircraft. We can view futures thinking as a kind of wind tunnel to ensure that our respective organizations will survive and complete their respective missions despite the uncertainties of the future. This process boosts our immune system as a civilization. It increases our inner capacity to deal with risk, uncertainties, and other drivers of change. It, it makes us more prepared and ready, therefore. Now, the strategic foresight methodologies range from quantitative to qualitative and from medium to long term in terms of time horizon. Our topic now is on scenarios and thus uh, strategic foresight uh, using scenario planning is officially the title of our uh, webinar today. Now, here is an example of a combination of what we call a roadmap and a Delphi method. This is still a work in progress and currently under review by uh, the key stakeholders. The Development Academy of the Philippines is preparing this document in partnership with experts from the academy and practitioners in the industry for the Philippine Coconut Authority. The time horizon is 50 years and uh, this is for the Coconut Farmers and Industry Development Plan, which is based on the Coconut Farmers and Industry Roadmap or COCO firm with the horizon of, from 2020 to 2040. Now, here is another example of the roadmap and the Delphi method. And this is a project or a study that the Academy conducted 
or prepared for the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. The time horizon is until 2050. This report was completed in 2016. So some of you might be interested, what might happen in 2050? Now, here are some snapshots of this study. In terms of population, there will be 142 million by 2045. On the good side, the natural resource in general will expand if we continue uh, our efforts to rehabilitate our damaged ecosystems. Rice production will increase more than twofold from 2012 to 2050. Annual average energy demand, however, will grow by 4.7% from 2013 to 2050. Fortunately, there will be reduction of direct greenhouse gas emission from the solid waste sector, maybe because by the time we will have used better ways of managing our solid waste. Now, in the 70s, in the mid-70s to be exact, the Academy and the University of the Philippines prepared a study that probed the future of the Philippines. The time horizon is 30 years. It is a collection of scenarios about the world situation, the Philippine population, among others. Now, in the report, the founding president of the Academy, Dr. Onofre Corpus, has this to say, scenarios are the perspectives of the future. There is not a single future ahead of us. There are several possible futures, and the question is, what are the futures in the future? If we can identify many possible futures and reduce this to probable futures, then we can select our preferred futures. Now, this type of thinking or scenario way of thinking you know, can avoid the traps of predictions by planning for a range of futures rather than focusing on one single future. In the past, planning for one future is possible since the critical uncertainties are not as pronounced and as disruptive as today. In scenario planning, we analyze the observable trends, events, and driving forces so that we can come up with or we can choose multiple futures or scenarios. Story A, story B, story C, and story D. Similar to the first two slides that I shared with you earlier. Now, in scenario planning, we ask three questions. Question number one, what will happen in the future? Or what is the plausible future? Question number two, what do we want to happen? Or what is our preferred future? And question number three, what might happen? Or what is the probable future? Now, these are questions that we have to wrestle with as we go through the scenario planning process. Now, let's look at the possible futures, as Dr. Corpus mentioned earlier. Imagine that we can use or we can probe the future using a powerful telescope so that we can see the possible futures or what are the features in the future. First of what we might see are what we call the possible futures. They are the widest range of futures. Now under the possible future, we have the plausible future. These are scenarios given the bounds of uncertainty. The plausible future, however, is determined by what we call the futures triangle, which means the pull of the future or the demands of the future, the push of the present, the need to get away from the present predicament, and the weight of the past. We know that as historical beings, individuals and organizations, we are influenced by the past and the present. And we carry these influences into our future. Under the plausible future, we have what we call the probable future. These are scenarios that are likely to happen or more likely to happen compared to other futures. And under the probable future, we have the preferable future. 
what we want to happen using appropriate strategies and actions or something more of a desirable future condition or state that is based on your hopes, your dreams, and your aspirations, including that of your stakeholders. Now, here is an example of multiple futures. The futures of the legislature prepared by the National Conference of State Legislatures in 2000. The time horizon is 25 years. So here, they used two critical uncertainties to construct the quadrant of the four scenarios. And the critical uncertainties are, number one, confidence in legislatures, the one on the center, vertical line. The arrow going up refers to high confidence in legislatures. The arrow going down is low confidence in legislatures. Now, the other critical uncertainty is use of direct democracy. So this is the horizontal line. Arrow going to the left is labeled as low use of direct democracy. The arrow going to the right is labeled as high use of direct democracy. There are different other critical uncertainties that this study has identified, but they choose the most powerful critical uncertainties at the time to construct this quadrant composing of the four scenarios. And here are the labels of these four scenarios in the future. Now imagine this was done in 2000 and this, is, this has a time horizon of about 25 years. So they are looking at the 2025 scenario or scenarios of the future of the legislature in the USA. So you have story A or scenario A, the harassed legislature, a strong legislature that is faced with a high level of demands and public scrutiny. Story B is the ideal legislature, a strong legislature that the public relies on and trust. And we have scenario C, the diminished legislature, a weak legislature that lacks public confidence and is supplanted by other government entities. And we have the fourth scenario, scenario D, the circumvented legislature. So here is a weak legislature faced with a public that is highly involved in direct democracy. Now, given these four scenarios, 25 years after 2000, the National Conference of State Legislatures came up with some strategies or robust strategies that will make them survive or still become relevant, no matter or regardless which of the scenarios or stories will actually unfold. So they are betting for the robust or the best possible strategies so that they can avoid the, the possibility of or the lure of planning for everything. So you have to be very purposive and therefore they have to be very strategic given the limited time and resources. Now here is another example of scenarios prepared by a team convened by the Asian Development Bank. And this shows the four scenarios on the future of alternative learning systems in the Philippines. And uh, there are four themes, namely no change, marginal change, adaptive change, and radical change. Now, for no change, now remember, this is scenarios for the future of the alternative learning systems. Now, under no change, these are the characteristics of the scenario. There is low or no demand not respected or at least valued, not accredited, courses that are offered through the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority or vocational schools. Now let's look at marginal change. High school students go to open universities to get diplomas. More courses related to agriculture, more course offerings. 
Another possible scenario is adaptive change, new courses for those working overseas, prison schooling as part of the rehabilitation, new courses offered for stay-at-home mothers, widen scope of people who will benefit to include overseas contract workers, rebels, and insurgents, courses on demand, and community-based learning. Now, here is another one, another possible scenario. Radical change. Brain-stimulated learning, meaning computers are linked with brains and upload learning materials. And uh, there are learning implants and possibly genetically modified learning. So again, they're looking at the future, at least this team, about the future of alternative learning systems based on observable trends patterns and driving forces that are happening all over the place, including, of course, technology. Now, which of these scenarios will actually happen, we cannot be certain. So that is an uncertainty. So given this uncertainty, what will be the strategies that will best be done in order to navigate around these possible scenarios or stories? So some of the key actions and key strategies are presented here, and these are embedding case groups in alternative learning, using classroom education, not only for technical, but also for cognitive learning, offering interesting electives, employing and adapting new technologies for learning, such as artificial intelligence, the use of robots, big data analytics, basically uh, data science and data analytics stuff, and quick changing student-driven or unstructured learning curriculum as compared to a rigid one and building capacity of teachers to increase their readiness for new technology. So bottom line, what does scenario planning does for us? Scenario planning helps us build stories of the future so that we can best identify the best possible strategies in case any of the futures that we have identified will occur rather than focus on only one possible future. Now, in the next slide, we have here the steps in conducting what we call scenario planning or developing scenarios. We will go through these steps tomorrow and uh, using an example that I have started in the early part of the presentation. So the seven steps include the following. Step number one, Framing challenge. This is one of the quite interesting but not an easy task in scenario development. So we will identify the or state the strategic challenge and also the framing question. Based on step number one, we proceed to step number two, the driving forces. So we will look at opportunities and threats and the driving forces along social, technological, economic, environmental, and political dimensions, or STEEP. Now, based on our listing of the driving forces, and I hope you can contribute your driving forces here. So please chat away. What do you think are the driving forces that will shape the future of public sector organizations so that we can use that as reference for tomorrow? Again, driving forces are critical uncertainties and including those uh, predetermined elements such as uh, population, what that will be, or what will be the level of population in the future, uh, what will be the volume of transaction perhaps that you will experience in the next 5, 10, 15 years, and so on. So more or less, these are some data that are predictable based on data that are available today. So you can just project. However, there are also critical uncertainties, and we, also, we already identified the VOCA drivers of change, including the wild cards and the black swans. So please feel free to put in the chat box what you think are the critical driving forces so that we can consider that in our scenario tomorrow. Now, the building blocks, as I said, are derived from the driving forces. We will choose the critical uncertainties similar to what the National Center for Legislatures uh, had done in 2000. And based on these critical uncertainties, we come up with the scenario stories using the scenario frameworks. So we will come up with 
an example of four storylines or four scenarios using the quadrants and also using critical uncertainty. So four and number five steps would give us the plausible scenarios and the scenario stories. Now the number six step, we look at the implications and options in terms of implications, options, and strategy or key actions and strategy or robust strategies that we can uh, purposely select so that we can be more agile in case which of the scenarios that we have identified will occur in the future. We are ready regardless of the scenario or which of the scenario might happen. And the seventh step, we look at indicators and signposts so that, or these are the future indicators to track so that we can also update our strategies and key action. So I'll walk you through, or we will walk you through these seven steps tomorrow using one example. And um, this is what I have in mind, a local government unit you know, with uh, certain strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And given the critical uncertainties, hopefully with your help, you know, I, I have seen some of you uh, putting in the chat box some critical uncertainties. Please continue. Social, technological, economic, environmental, and political critical uncertainties. Uh, some of you might use the PESEL or the PES, PESTEL approach, okay, so that we can identify the critical uncertainties for this particular local government unit. Uh, not specific, but at least we can construct one so that I can walk you through what will be the robust or best possible strategies to deal with the uncertain futures, such as, for example, the business as usual or the current scenario, better than current, the preferred future, and the ideal future. Now, when we go to scenario planning process, there are some principles that we need to keep in mind. The first, very important, is the use of outside in thinking. Now, to understand outside in thinking, let us consider our overused means of thinking or thinking process. This is the inside out thinking. In other words, most of our thinking is inside out thinking. We start with a problem or an issue from our own perspective, and then we explore or look for solutions to fix the problem or the issue. And then, of course, we make decisions because we think this is the best way to do it. And we make decisions for our customers, for our clients, for our citizens, because we think it is best for them. That, ladies and gentlemen, is inside out thinking. Most of the time, we do that a lot. Now, in scenario planning, we do another kind of thinking in addition to divergent thinking. This is the outside in thinking which means we look at our operations, our processes in our organizations from the perspective of our stakeholders, in particular, our customers, the citizen. We listen to them. We try to understand them. And we make decisions based on what are the needs and requirements and expectations of our customers, our clients, our citizens. So, we decide because this is what we see as the best option for them using data that we gathered from them or according to our stakeholders. So that's very important when we go to a scenario planning process. Divergent thinking with outside in thinking. Now the second aspect is to embrace diverse perspectives. Okay, what does embracing diverse perspectives? It starts with looking at or valuing the perspective of other people, other individuals, or other perspectives that are probably contrary to our own perspectives. Okay, so we are not, or we do not rely on our own press release. We also look at the opinions and ideas of other individuals. And um, also very important is to take the long view. No, uh, scenario planning is a technique that is useful for 10, 15, or perhaps 20 years time horizon. We have other tools that we use for uh, scanning the future for less than 10 years. All right. So again, 
let's carry these principles when we walk through the process, use outside in thinking, embrace diverse perspectives, and take the long view. Now, in relation to embracing diverse perspectives, when we go into scenario planning, or when you start practicing scenario planning, you can become a scenarist. Okay. The originators of scenario planning actually borrowed this term from literature, it's in particular from cinema. Now, so you notice in the movies, they have scenes. And in these scenes, there are actors and actresses role-playing very specific parts of the story. Or there are people with very specific assigned roles, for example, that will make the story more believable and appealing to everyone. So an effective scenarist would have multidisciplinary skills. And these are some examples of the skills. And this is related, again, to divergent thinking, embracing diverse perspectives. As an effective scenarist, according to our trainers, they would include a salesperson, organizational psychologist, a facilitator, okay, able to allow others to participate in the discussion without dominating the discussion. We also need a futurist. Okay, if, you, if any one of you would, be, would like to become a futurist later on by practicing scenario planning, among others, strategic foresight, uh, future studies, future thinking, so you will become a futurist. We also need research analysts, no, journalists, teacher, novelist, project manager, industry analyst, uh, meeting designer, networker, event organizer, business consultant. What do these different skills mean? It means that they are able to enrich the story or the different scenarios that we are preparing or developing. So when you embark on a scenario planning process, it is very important that you identify the participants properly so that you can have a rich um, discussion of ideas and therefore a believable and powerful stories that will appeal to different stakeholders. Let me end at this point uh, so that if you have some questions, I can still uh, respond to them. Um, but before we go to the Q&A portion, I'd like to invite you to a video about uh, strategic foresight and scenario planning. How do you plan for the future in a fast-changing world? While you might be right in forecasting that the near future will be quite similar, what about 10, 20, 30 years from now? Over longer time horizons, current trends just simply won't hold, and old rules may no longer apply. The past was riddled with too many bad decisions. Inventions, empires and large-scale corporate organizations have fallen short in the test of time, not because the future could not be seen, but failing to anticipate it. Getting to the bottom of how cautionary tales of the past have unfolded, we learn three very important lessons. You can't predict the future. It is impossible. The future is not predetermined. What we do today influences how the future might play out. Fortunately, there is scenario planning. This exercise seeks to find the right path and embraces multiple futures that could be a potential reality in waiting. But why are we looking at the future from multiple lenses? As we said earlier, even if you try to predict the future, you might be reduced to a single course of action that may end up being the wrong one. Oftentimes, the road to the future gets disrupted by bold new trends and forces. By virtue of anticipating multiple futures, we avoid the dangers of simplistic and one-dimensional thinking. Let's explore how scenario planning works with a simple example. A defining aspect of the approach is the idea that there are many futures. To arrive at multiple plausible futures, a scenario planning expands 
a range of future assumptions. Based on a quantification of leading and lagging indicators, scenario planning blends creativity and imagination to create multiple plausible scenarios. This is done by considering three main phases, where we are now, where we want to go and how to get there. Firstly, the first phase looks into the current state of affairs and promotes active management of resources to increase future readiness. By looking underneath issues and trends impacting the future, scenario planning brings multiple stakeholders together to create an image of the future that captures the most relevant. The path to the future is a series of crossroads and intersections. To plot a path to the right answer that allows us to undertake actions to our eventual advantage. By putting in place the dynamics of how plausible future scenarios might play out. The final phase sets out to design a flexible solution that will keep us competitive, agile and relevant regardless whichever future comes to pass. To succeed, we must choose the right approach at the right time and stay tuned to a changing environment. We are definitely better preparing than predicting to improve the odds. Thank you, Dr. Kais, for that very insightful lecture. So it's a great reminder for us, especially in the public sector, of the significance of future thinking and responding to future uncertainty. We are living in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Like what you said, we can be in denial of change. We can just passively wait and see what will happen next. Or we can choose to be prepared to face the uncertain future strategically. I believe we can all have many takeaways from the short lecture this afternoon and there will be more tomorrow. So let's all be excited for that. For now, we will move on to the Q&A session. As mentioned, the team has been creating questions from the chat box and we have already chosen a few to be answered live by Dr. Kaes. Our first question is from Ms. Castro of the Bureau of Local Health Systems and Development. Her question is, how do government managers prepare their current manpower for the future of their organization? So I think, what is your suggestion for government managers to prepare their manpower power for the future of their government agencies maybe you can enrich the process of strategic planning or organizational planning that you are doing including human resource development planning so that we can provide scenarios or we can interject scenario building in completing the plan now remember strategic foresight scenario planning is not a replacement of strategic planning and the other usual planning that we do but yes scenario planning can enrich this so maybe through a specific session with the employees with our fellow in the office or colleagues in the office you can convene them you know, certain teams or um, conduct a series of workshops assign them a framing challenge and a strategic question and then continue with the seven steps of scenario planning well of course the other one is introduce some training programs on uh, scenario planning strategic thinking among others by the way we have uh, an online course on data science and data analytics and that is free uh, please uh, check the internet you know, that is dap sparta course on data science and data analytics free po yan from the department of science and technology Thank you, Dr. Kais. I think you can visit the website at sparta.dap.edu.ph. So you can uh, bookmark that. So our next question is from Amalia Tabingo from the Public Attorney's Office, Mandaluyong District. She is asking for government agencies, what are the important resources to consider in planning for a range of future scenarios? So what are the resources needed, sir, for the scenario planning of their organization? So what do you have to prepare for? Okay, very important. You have to keep in mind who will be the participant. You know, are they coming from the office or do you have somebody outside your office or organization that, that can participate in not necessarily all of the steps, but at least in some of the steps. So can give uh, insights and contribute in the discussion 
or maybe you can use data gathering instruments or tools like uh, key informants interview among others so data is i think the most important resource that you need and data comes from not just from individuals but also from other sources and uh, these are data from predetermined elements things that are already happening that we can actually discern by analyzing the data that we have and we also have uh, key drivers the critical uncertainties that i mentioned along social technological economic environmental and political domain um thank you dr guys for your answer if you subscribe to the world economic forum and i think the economist intelligence unit uh, they have some uh, information about events that are unfolding and you can actually check which of these events might be relevant or critical to your respective organization thank you dr kas for the suggestion for additional resources on scenario planning we move on to the next question from mr brian john rodriguez he is asking how important are historical data in projecting future plans in the local government currently government agencies use historical data analysis in planning their programs projects and activities but unforeseen circumstances like the covid-19 pandemic have shaken this kind of planning strategy on this note what other possible techniques may be adopted in order to not be appalled or blown away by such unforeseen circumstances reliance on historical or quantitative data to a large extent it's it's not wrong per se now we are still doing that in fact one of the driving forces that we need to consider are what we call the predetermined elements now for example uh, trends in terms of previous past performance along many data points or data sets these are still essential in terms of additional information for us but again we do not rely on this data alone uh, these are not the only information that we need we also rely on qualitative data coming from perspectives of participants of the scenario planning process so it's very important that we have the right individuals joining in the process of scenario or building the scenarios because the creativity the ingenuity you know and the wisdom of the participants to a large extent will help uh, provide color and layer to the stories or to the scenarios more than what uh, statistics can provide all right thank you dr kais for another suggestion in executing the scenario planning in different government agencies so we move on to the next question from regino malabanan he is asking how can we increase the applicability of ex ante evaluation of strategic and medium term plans and be more honest in the disclosure of such evaluation we cannot say for certain that it is directly related to strategic foresight or scenario planning but just like any quantitative data that we gather from uh, historical experience you now ex ante or uh, impact evaluation studies you know, are also very important because of the wisdom that they carry as a result of the analysis so we have to make sure that this information are used and disseminated obviously so that it can be used by the stakeholders especially those who are designing programs or projects that are related to uh, the topic that was subjected to impact evaluation studies so i think that's one of the very important way forward for impact evaluation studies now where are they now and how are they communicated to the different stakeholders all right thank you dr kais for your answer we have another question from mr gerald duwagan he is asking how should we integrate future thinking as a management or leadership paradigm in our own units taking into account the rigidity of organizational or bureaucratic systems and processes i noticed that scenario planning can actually be used for even small or bite size projects not necessarily over overall organization type of 
uh, questions or framing question. You can be very be very specific. Um, I think I I saw a question about how strategic foresight and scenario planning can be used to address uh, gender and development issues. Maybe you can have a framing question or a strategic challenge and framing question related to that very specific aspect and then let the participants construct the, the scenarios or the stories and later on identify the possible strategies. That is also true with leadership and management. So maybe at a, at a unit level, the officers and staff can convene and maybe have some discussions about a strategic challenge or framing question. For instance, how can we, uh, for an example of a challenge is how can we become more effective in terms of supporting our organizational mandate, let us say, is especially in relation to achieving ambition 2040 or sustainable development goals or any other planning document that you are that is relevant to your respective unit i'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow but but yes definitely you can use scenario planning even for bite-sized type of issues or uh, opportunities all right sir so in relation to what you've mentioned mr adrian benedict manalaysay is asking how can futures thinking help the government in promoting gender equality, women empowerment, so GSC or sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual characteristics, non-discrimination, and youth participation? I think that is a very good example of a strategic challenge that the concerned organization can undertake. And uh, you can invite uh, your stakeholders or the participants to create the scenarios using a framing challenge, a strategic challenge and framing question, and later on paint the stories in relation to this particular topic, and then come up with a, or derive the possible robust strategies and key actions that may be applicable not just to your organization, but also for the rest of the bureaucracy. Thank you, and we would like to give a round of applause to Dr. Cajes for taking time to share with us the relevant insights on futures thinking. So unfortunately, that's the only time we have. We have more time tomorrow. We are very looking forward to our continuation of our discussion on strategic foresight. Thank you, Dr. Cajes. You will be joining us again tomorrow. And for all of our participants, please don't forget to evaluate through the link that is provided in the chat box section. The handouts and certificates will be issued to those who will um, submit their evaluation form of the two webinar episodes. So we have another one tomorrow. So in behalf of the Academy, I would like to thank everyone for watching. And we hope that you learned a lot from this session. We're excited to see you again tomorrow, 2 p.m. Philippine Standard Time, for our next topic, Steps in Strategic Foresight Using Scenario Development, only here at the Public Sector Productivity Webinars. Thank you very much and see you again tomorrow.